So we found that a naive attempt to cascade dynamic gates is not going to work. But actually, there are easy solutions to this problem that make dynamic circuits practically useful. So to find the solution for cascading, we have to actually consider the fact that dynamic gates so far have been formed by sandwiching a pull-down network between a clock PMOS and a clock NMOS and taking the output at the drain of the clock PMOS. There's an alternative to this, which uses actually the pull-up network, which is sandwiched between, again, a clock PMOS and a clock NMOS. In this case, the output is taken at the drain of the clock NMOS, not at the drain of the clock PMOS. And so let's consider what's happening here. Um, when the, um, let's take an example. Let's take, for example, this pull-up network and this clock transistors. And now let's look at the clock. The output node is next to the NMOS transistor. And so the output node is either going to be zero volt or VDD. Let's see how it can be a zero volt or a VDD. When the clock is equal to one, the transistor MN is on and the transistor MP is off. This causes the output voltage to drop to zero volt regardless of the inputs to A and B and C. And so when the clock is one, the output is always zero volt. This is analogous to the fact that the output was always VDD when the clock was zero for normal dynamic gates. So we call this phase pre-discharge. And it is analogous to the pre-charge phase in normal dynamic gates. The output has no logic value. It is just preparing a zero volt for evaluate. When we enter the zero phase of the clock, then we enter the evaluate phase. During the evaluate phase, the transistor MN is cut off and the transistor MP is on. One of two things is going to happen in this case. Either the pull-up network provides a path to supply. This is, of course, going to happen through transistor MP as well, but MP is on because the clock is zero, in which case we are evaluating a one, and that one is going to be evaluated to VDD. But notice that in this case, the VDD actually comes through a short circuit, through a low impedance path to supply which happens through the pull-up network and through the transistor MP. And so this is actually low impedance. Or we are trying to evaluate a zero, in which case the inputs to the PON do not provide a path to supply, and in which case the capacitor at the output node is facing a, an open circuit in all directions. At the top direction, it's facing an open circuit created by the pull-up network. At the bottom, it's facing a pull -up, uh, an open circuit created by the transistor MN, and therefore output is going to be equal to zero volt because uh, because we entered this phase with a pre-discharged capacitor that pre-discharged during the pre-discharged phase. So again, we have only one case in which the output node is high impedance, but in this case, it is when we are trying to evaluate a zero. So this is um, complementary in all ways to the uh, normal dynamic circuit that we, uh, we have looked at so far except that it, you know, it uses a pull-up network instead of a pull-down network. So the output is taken at the bottom instead of at the top. It's going to pre-discharge during the one phase of the clock instead of the zero phase of the clock. It's going to produce a low impedance VDD, but a high impedance zero volt during evaluate. So which one would you choose? I would definitely choose this one, the one that uses the NMOS, because if I have to uh, design a pull-up network instead of a pull-down network, these PMOSs have to be bigger to provide the same resistance during evaluate, which is going to cause more uh, loading on the previous stage and more self-loading on this stage. So in general, P uh, stages are bad. So in general, we call these N stages, the ones designed using PDNs, and these P stages, the ones designed using pull-up networks. However, N and P stages, when they are cascaded together so that every N stage is followed by a P stage, and every P stage is followed by N, an N stage, they solve the cascading problem that we discussed in the previous video. So in this case, notice that the clock signal provided to the N stage is the opposite of the clock signal provided to the P stage. What this does is it allows everybody to pre-charge or pre-discharge during the same phase of the clock and to evaluate during the same phase of the clock. So let's see what's happening here. 
Uh, during the pre-charge phase, the end stage, the first end stage is going to pre-charge its output 1 to VDD. And then during evaluate, this VDD is either going to remain at VDD as a high impedance or go down to zero volt as a low impedance. So that's what's going to happen at output 1. How is this affecting the uh, second stage P? During the zero phase of the clock, P actually sees a clock bar of 1. And so it pre-discharges and output 2 is going to pre-discharge to zero volt. During the evaluate phase of the clock, output 2 is going to either preserve the zero volt as a, low, as a high impedance or it's going to charge up to VDD as low impedance, right? So if you look at N2, right, N2 is going to observe an input. So first of all, during pre-charge, it's going to pre-charge to VDD. Now during evaluate, it's going to observe an input that is one of two things. That is zero volt and remains at zero volt, in which case it's just going to maintain its VDD. Or that was zero volt and then charged up to VDD, in which case this guy is going to discharge down to, v, to zero volt. So why are we not suffering from uh, cascading issues? The thing here is that while the P stage is charging up, so while the P stage is charging up output 2, the stage N2 is going to observe an input that changes, right? So when the input goes up to 2V threshold N, the stage N2 is going to notice an input that is a logic 1 and will start to discharge. So output out 3 is not going to start to discharge until this output actually reaches 2V threshold N, in which case it will discharge down to 0. But that's not bad. That's not catastrophic. It, it just means a little bit more delay. And it just, at the end of the day, output 3 is going to be the correct value, right? Um, why did this solve the problem, though, for cascading? Because what happens here is that the input transistor of stage N2 starts out off and then decides it needs to be on when it observes a voltage that is high enough. So what's happening here is that we started out at zero and then went up to one at this point, which, which solves the problem. We had a problem because we started out at one and then went down to zero. And this caused us to lose charge during this period down to, to the threshold N, which is irretrievable. In this case, we are not losing any charge. We're not going to lose charge. We're just going to hold on to the charge a little bit longer and then decide we, we need to get rid of it. So N stages are very sensitive to inputs that decide that they want to be zero too late. But they are not sensitive to inputs that decide that, decide that they want to be one too late because that's a conservative state. Also, at the input of the P stage, we have to make sure that that didn't cause a problem, right? So at the input of the P stage, the output from uh, the N stage starts out at VDD, right? And then goes down to zero. The PMOS at the input of the P stage is going to turn on only when the input is about 2V threshold P absolute value. And so what's going to happen here is that it's going to turn on a little bit later. So again, this only adds a little bit delay, but it doesn't cause a catastrophic loss of charge on uh, the output node of the P stage. And so we can cascade stages as long as we alternate between N stages and P stages. There's a, an interesting uh, observation here, which is why do we need the tail transistor, the tail and MOS transistors for uh, the end stages? Uh, we needed them in general because we want, during the pre-charge phase, we want all the current that is provided through the pre-charge PMOS to go to pre-charging the output node capacitance. We don't want this current to do anything else. And now the NMOS, the tail NMOS, what it does is that it ensures that there is an open circuit in the pull-down network because we are not sure about input. We're not sure about this logic input, right? So this creates a, an open circuit which guarantees that no static current will flow between supply and ground. So what if we didn't use this tail transistor? Then if input is equal to 1 during the pre-charge phase, What's going to happen is the current provided by the pre-charged PMOS is going to be a short circuit current to ground and it is not going to charge the capacitor. So that's the problem here, right? But what if we can guarantee that input is going to be zero during pre-charge phase? If we can guarantee that, then we can get rid of the tail and MOS transistor. We can get rid of the clock and MOS 
and have proper operation. Can we guarantee that? Yes, we can, because every input to an N stage now comes from a P stage. During pre-charge, all the P stages pre-discharge down to zero volt. All the N, N, N stages pre-charge up to uh, VDD. And so what we can do is actually get rid of all the NMOS transistors in the N stages and all the PMOS transistors in the P stages because their logic inputs will guarantee that there is an open circuit during pre-charge and pre-discharge. And so uh, we don't actually need these transistors. And when we get rid of them, that helps in sizing because you can now size the transistors to be much smaller and still have the same resistance. So that helps with delay again.